What's happening is Len Davis with Pangeality Productions, and I'm here in the Chinatown Financial District neighborhood of downtown San Francisco with my main man and dear friend Sharif Bashay, and we are here at Dev Boot Camp, uh, his new enterprise that I'm seeing for the first time and just learning more about and totally digging. So I thought we'd take this opportunity with my brother Sharif to tell us a little bit about where, what this is all about, what's behind it, and where it fits in the world. So take it away, brother. Where are we? We're in the heart of San Francisco. This is where all the action happens. Um, <laughs> we, Which kind of action? Um, all the action happens okay. within pretty much the one mile radius from here. You can get anything you want in the world. You don't really need to leave. This is it. This is, this is the center right from, here. From crack to Prada. Everything from crack to Prada. <laughs> Sometimes on the same block. Um, and this is Dev Bootcamp headquarters, also the only headquarters and office. Um, we train about 40 to 50 people here three times a year to be software engineers. Take anybody from any background and we turn them into nerds. Now, when you say software engineer, and at the same time, I know that this is about developer programming, etc. Are those the same thing or is there some, uh, I thought this was for software developers or, or programmers and then I hear you say software engineer. Are those the same thing or yes. where? Got it. I know. Depends who you talk to. Coder, programmer, web developer, software engineer, software developer, web developer. It's all the same thing. Okay. So what is really behind, I'm going to just switch this so I can sort of focus on, what is really at the heart of this? What makes this a unique approach to doing what you do? This guy right there. Lockie does everything. Um, <laughs> we all just support Lockie. What's unique about this? About the approach, about what you've put together here. You know, I went to college and studied computer science. And then on my first day on my first job, I realized that 90% of what I learned was not relevant. So I figured... If only 10% was relevant, why not just teach that 10%? So what's unique about here is that there's very little to no bullshit. Like you just learn what you're actually going to need to make shit happen and not a lot of theory. Unless the theory is within the context of this is how you build this thing. And also like from day one, you're just hands-on learning. You know, like you can learn French by reading a book twice a week or you can go to Paris for three months and that's a better way to get started. So what is the implication that how does this become Paris as opposed to the book to, re to learn French? Well, it's immersive. People are here 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week. Um, they're programming from day one. They're not like, you know, getting the theory of programming. They're just like, hey, build this now. And like we've set them up with like a bunch of things that they can build progressively, a bunch of challenges. So it's hands on. It's like the difference between saying, let me talk to you about color theory or giving you a paintbrush and saying paint a flower. Um, so that's kind of like a, a, a pedagogy, pedagogical difference, right? Hmm. How does this enterprise represent the sort of culmination of where you're at in your own particular journey, both as an entrepreneur, as an individual, as someone who is involved in the evolution of technology, as well as sort of thinking about the world and what the world needs? Um, the, well, for me, my part in, for where I'm in my life right now, um, it's kind of it brings together all the different thing, all different things that I was passionate about that I worked on. I, I uh, worked a lot in the nonprofit world, leading workshops in emotional intelligence land, and I worked a lot in the tech field. And for me, this is a place where I can be in person with people, working with people, which I love to do, and also with technology, which I love. So um, it's the only school in the world where on you know, any particular Tuesday, you're asked to build an object-oriented model of a to-do list and also sit in a circle and talk about your feelings. Tell we me a little we bit. We make everybody cry. Tell me about that. What, tell me a little bit more about the emotional intelligence and sort of, uh, I, you know, I'm not really sure how else to describe it, but you work in computers and you talk about programming all day, but there's also a very central component about interpersonal communication and personal exploration and right. emotional depth, yeah? So any projects you work on, especially in software, but even in film or anything, the biggest risk to that project failing is not that people won't technically know how to do something. The biggest risk is that the team will fall apart because internal politics, people taking things personally, people, you know, personality clashes, power dynamics, and so forth. So the biggest risk to any company or any team, or I think anything in the world, is like you just not getting, not playing well with others, right? We never get deliberate training on how to play well with others, how to give feedback, how to get feedback, how to resolve a conflict, how to tell somebody you don't like them but you still want to work with them. Like, how do you do that? Um, and so we practice that from day one. It's like, 
look, here's how you get feedback in a way that other people are less likely to take personally. Here's how you should try and get feedback so that you can be better and learn not to step on people's toes. And we talk about like kind of internal voices in our head that make it hard to stay receptive and respectful to other people and, and give each other a lot of feedback. And so that's kind of built in from day one. And the point is you walk out of that boot camp, not necessarily transformed as a person, but at least with a really clear idea about what you can do better to play well with others. Like some people walk out going, wow, I really need to work on my humility or wow, I really need to work on you know, representing myself more. I kind of underspeak, I don't show up in my power, I defer to other people when I have a lot of smart things that I'm thinking but I'm just keeping them to myself. And examples of things like that that get reflected to you here over the 10 weeks where you just walk out going, I know where my work is both technically and interpersonally. Awesome. So what, what is the vision here? What are people who walk away with the knowledge that a 10-week program that Dev Bootcamp offers, what do they step out of here with and how, where do they take that in the world? Where, and I'm specifically thinking in terms of where are we at in this particular point in time in terms of technology, the way that people use the internet, whether it's about commerce or it's about anything from creativity to relationships, etc. People walk out of here with certain skills that enable them to do what? People walk out of here, we call it like a world-class beginner. Like you are really, walking out of that boot camp, you're in a great position to keep learning how to be a software developer for the rest of your life. You're just oriented on the path, right? You're a stream enterer. Um, well, I think we're at, we're at a point in time where coding is a new literacy. And I think in 10, 20 years, if you don't know how to make a machine do something that you want it to do, it's like, it's like today not knowing how to do email. You know, or not knowing how to read and write, you have somebody else do it for you. You know, it's like McCain or something. Like, yeah, I have somebody read my emails for me. That's how it's going to sound like if in 10 years, you're like, oh, I have a programmer program for me. I have a program build my websites for me. It's like, why? Why, why didn't you take the, the few weeks it it's necessary to learn this new literacy? Um, I think software is eating the world. Every single industry is being reshaped by software. Every single industry will have a software component to it. Even your industry, every industry. Um, and so, you know, some people will be pro professional software developers, but everyone will know how to code if they want to get ahead in the world, if they want to participate in participate. So what are the words programming and coding mean? You say everyone will know how to code, <clears throat> but even for someone like myself, who's relatively technologically savvy, I don't have a clear sense of what it means to quote unquote code. Does that mean to write lines of code that enable the website that I'm using to enable me to do what I'm trying to do on that given website? Okay, so that's a great question. People who are technical, technologically savvy, like yourself, know how to use WordPress, for example. People who know how to code create WordPress. They're the ones who built WordPress. So the difference between being constrained to use things that other people built versus building things yourself that other people use. What are the implications of what you just said? What are the implications? Yeah, the difference between being able to use what someone else built as opposed to being able to build that something else. Yes, yeah, so it's like the difference between being restricted to shopping versus creating yourself. Being restricted to only buying music on iTunes versus knowing how to pick up a guitar and make, make, make tunes yourself. So just out of curiosity, without getting too tangential, how does the 3D printer fit into what you just said? How does the 3D printer <laughs> Um, I mean, the 3D printer, open source manufacturing, all of that is basically part of a trend to bring the making, to this distributed making, right? No longer is making centralized. The same way that publishing was centralized 30 years ago, but today anybody with a keyboard and an internet access can be a publisher. It's the same with being a maker, with being a software creator, with being a writer. Like The idea of the industrialized kind of revolution where like everything is centralized and we're all consuming that so centralized resources is dying and software is just part of it like we're we're just not going to be using other people's software we're going to be creating our own software obviously building off of other people's software and, and collaborating with them but just the idea of like well i you know i really wish my website did this thing but it doesn't or i really wish my you know i really wish there was a wordpress plugin for that but there isn't or that's, that just means you're illiterate, literally. Hmm. Can you give me a quick tour of what's going on here and what happens in this space on a ton week sure. course? This right here is Locky. He's our central uh, marketing and PR department right here. That's all happening in there. New laptop showing the laptop. Yes, very nice new laptop shine. Um, <laughs> coming forward. 
these are the pairing stations where people work. Um, essentially, we've got 54 pairing stations. Everybody works on the same like on the same computer with one other person. They're sharing a monitor. The key two keyboards both control the same uh, cursor. So you're essentially driving and navigating with one other person, learning and teaching from them. Right. And why is that significant to have that pairing as opposed? Like, why is that central to this model? Because central to this learning model is an apprenticeship model and a mentorship model. You learn something much better if you're showing it to somebody else. And you learn something much better if somebody else is showing it to you rather than you're just isolated by yourself doing it. We're social creatures. We weren't really meant to learn by ourselves isolated. Um, so, you know, cheating is encouraged here. So exactly like if you're not cheating, you're not learning basically. Um, why, think do, about kids, why do you like call that cheating though? Them. It's just, I'm just making a joke based on like how you know, the traditional education system keeps you so isolated and actually like punishes you for looking over to, to see how somebody else is doing something, whereas that's literally our impulse is to learn by looking over and seeing how somebody else is doing something. Why do we prevent it? This here we actually just make it mandatory. You gotta look over and see how somebody else is doing something. Um, and you gotta share what you've just learned. Got this it. is how we spread knowledge. And this is our instruction area. So we come here for group discussions, if we wanna do code reviews, Try and keep it to a minimum, um, like maybe half an hour, 40 minutes a day of somebody talking at you or with you, and the rest of the time people are in here coding. And then this is a little breakout room where we have uh, breakout sessions. So, where's the linoleum? <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. For the break dancing. Oh, for the break dancing. Um, yeah. So breakout sessions are basically our optional lectures that happen. People, it's walk in, walk out. You walk in if you want to participate, you walk out at any time, and, and they're by pull demand only. So when people who are here who are learning, they want to see a lecture on something, they request it, and then if there's enough requests, we do a breakout on it, and they can come in and walk out at any time. It's a way of basically not forcing people to sit and listen to somebody talk if, unless they really want to. Mm -hmm. um, and so just give me a sense of who participates in this program and what are the actual sort of, you know, overall quick sense of who comes, where do they come from, and what can they expect to... People who come are generally people who really want to be software engineers. They want to, they want to program, they have a passion for it. They've tried it on their own and they've been frustrated like by the resources and like just banging their head against the wall for too long. So they have some enough of a taste of it that they figure like, I'm gonna love doing this, I want to do this for a living. Um, but they may be total beginners. They may be just like, I, I've just got the taste for it and I'm passionate about it and I want to learn it. Um, they come from all over the world. We have people from Australia, from London, from Germany. Um, they come from all walks of life, high school dropouts, to people with PhDs, to people with masters in computer science, physicists, ex-teachers, ex-neuroscientists, whatever. We've got everybody from 16-year-olds to oldest, I think, is 53. Um, but we have a 70-year-old applying for the spring and looks like she's going to get in. Um, so. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a mechanism in place also for helping them to find jobs after the program? Yes, absolutely. So we have over 80 companies came to our hiring day a couple of weeks ago. And we did, well, 80 companies were invited. I think about 50 showed up. And there were 40 graduates here. So we did 2,000 interviews in this room in six hours. Five minutes, speed dating interviews. Um, and then people are getting jobs. About 94% of our graduates got a job average salary, starting salary was $80,000. And I remember reading something on your site about the, what are the, for women who want to participate in this program as a way of encouraging more women to enter this field. Refresh my memory on that component of what you do? There's, we have a small scholarship for women or for underrepresented uh, minorities like African Americans or anybody who basically the tech industry tends to just have an underrepresentation of. We're notoriously white men and Indian man dominated industry uh, for various reasons and it's a problem that most of us are wanting to address and tackle head on. So this is sort of our, our, for our the scholarship is sort of our token attempt to be like, hey, we recognize this problem and we w really want to encourage women and underrepresented minorities to come here. We also do a lot of women outreach to women coding groups and um, do a training on sexism and racism in week three. And, yeah, it's basically our attempt to be like, you know, things are not balanced. The more balanced they are, the happier we all will be. Like, and the just more successful we all will be is a problem, huge one. And it's our, our like, first attempt at cracking it. What are some of the examples of the half-day sort of emotional intelligence component 
that you build in? What are some examples of the kinds of activities that you will lead as part of the non-technology side of becoming a fuller person, etc.? One example would be we do a half day on feedback. So people practicing how to give feedback to, to each other, uh, appreciations or criticisms or feeling, you know, pinched or not heard by somebody else and how to receive it, how to um, receive an appreciation or receive a criticism, how to take responsibility. We do a lot of practices around that. We do, like I said, uh, sexism and racism training where we actually get to explore these issues and think about it. Um, a lot of a lot of reflecting on sort of the voices inside our head that keep us from being fully expressed and you know feeling free to create and to learn. Like we have this we have this inner critic that keeps us from doing that properly. So we explore that, um, but also a lot of community building, a lot of you know getting to see each other beyond the ideas, the superficial ideas that we have with each other. Got it. So, how long has Dev Bootcamp been up running and? if you were to look two to three years into the future, both in terms of your own growth as an organization, but also recognizing the rate of change and the evolution of technology, where do you see Dev Bootcamp being in two to three years? Um, or five or 10 Dev or Bootcamp's wherever? Dev Bootcamp's been up for seven months right now. Um, just graduated our second class. Since we started, there's been over 20 clones in different cities uh, doing the same thing four of which are people, students, or ex-teachers from here. Um, I suspect that by the end of the year there'll be more than 40, 40 or 50 clones. Um, I think it's great. I think, I think basically the main fight we're picking is with universities that claim to have a vocational aspect to them that actually don't end up putting students in debt and actually don't end up training their students in, in a skill that's market worthy and market ready. Um, so I, I suspect that the trend will be more and more of these boot camp style hacker academies, both in software engineering and other things, that are much more focused on like, look, come in here and on your way out you'll have a skill that the market actually needs immediately. And reserve university for the time where you have the luxury to spend $100,000 on liberal arts education, which is really important and really useful, but also a, a true luxury if you can't even afford to you know, pay your own rent. So it seems to me like for me, the trend will be university pushed to later and later in life, being reduced to the few good ones out there who actually do an actual liberal arts education, and then vocational training making a comeback. Um, and actually, you know, also one trend I see is the word vocational training being actually uh, a much more respected word than it is today. You know, some vocational training seems like a, you know, in the culture, it's like this thing that you do if you can't get to college, right? If you can't be an elite university person, you do the vocational training. I'm like, this is elite. Like, you get to make $80,000 when you're 23 years old and work in something you love and create the world as we know it. You know, software is running it. That's what's elite. And then a liberal arts education becomes a luxury that you take maybe when you're 30, when you're 40, and when you're, when you're ready to mm -hmm. learn those things. And you've created that model specifically around building developer programmer people do you see that exact model and idea about education transferring to other industries and emerging Absolutely. yeah design ux film like there's so much you could learn in 10 weeks or 12 weeks look you're not going to become a, you're not going to become like a master in that time but you will become a professional beginner like if i intensively teach you film for four months i assume that you can walk out being useful on a crew where you can learn the rest, where you can just, you know, make your 30 bucks an hour working on a film crew, and then that's where you pick up the rest of your skill, like an apprentice. So why not, why not have it applied to everything? I don't see, I mean, besides maybe super specialized things like heart surgery, but even that, I can imagine a heart surgeon being trained in an intensive environment. I mean, they kind of are. Doctors are kind of have these, you know, residency programs where they get hands-on training. I just think there's too much theory being taught for vocational training. Nice. My last question is, in times that we've spoken in the past, I always remembered the general bones around the quote of going out in the world and finding what makes you come alive and then going out and do that because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. Yeah. Tell me the quote and tell me how Dev Boot Camp serves that purpose with the skills and the whatever you're giving people to go out in the world and face that challenge. So I think the, qu the quote goes something like, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself 
what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is more people who've come alive, something like that. Um, I mean, the way it ties into here is like, people who show up to Dev Bootcamp are super passionate about this. They want to be creators, they want to be makers, they want to develop software for a living, and they have huge ambitions. And they quit jobs, they come across the country, they spend $12,000 for these things, they take huge risks. And by the time they walk in through the door, as far as I'm concerned, 70% of the job is done. And the rest is easy. This is the part where they just like hang out and learn this stuff. And to me, like every one of my students is an example of them living that quote of going like, you know what? Screw this like accounting job that I have is not what I'm passionate about. I want to do this and like screw what everybody's telling me about I like, can't be done, it's too late, it's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to come do it and come alive. Um, for me personally, I love coming to work and I feel the fruits of it on a daily basis. Awesome. Anything else you want to say? I love you, Len. I love you too, brother. <laughs> so it's Len Davis with Pangeality Productions. I'm here with my brother, Sharif Bashay in the financial district slash Chinatown in San Francisco at the current, perhaps temporary as it grows, headquarters of Dev Bootcamp, Sharif's new enterprise that it's a joy to learn about and hear from you about where this fits in the world as well as in your own personal journey. Sweet. Stay fresh. Peace.